Okay, welcome to our uh, podcast Wisdom Workshop and I'm very glad to see you again, Julia. Hi, Povi. Just take your time and focus what's really important for you, but also how you can help the world to yeah, keep its beauty. And I'm very, very um, excited to have uh, my old friend uh, as a guest today, Nicole Sagner. Hi and welcome, Nicole. <laughs> Since I was not very sure what uh, we are going to talk about today and, and then I went through your uh, profile uh, in LinkedIn, Nicole, I think it's a wonderful um, headline, but we will, work, we, will, we will work towards there to talk about passion and purpose. And I would like you to, to introduce yourself, who you are and a little bit about your uh, CV. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, um, I come originally from Stuttgart, so and we went to school together. Yes. And yeah, so I made my school and I uh, worked in a pharmacy. I made some study towards a pharmacy and worked there for a while. And yeah, all of a sudden I thought it's, I don't know, maybe a bit boring. So I changed towards something else and I wanted to work on a desk as well and have my desk and my computer and just do something else. So I decided to change towards the pharmaceutical industry. There was a job offer and yes, yeah, so I moved to Frankfurt. I got that job uh, in Frankfurt and it's in a pharmaceutical industry. And I worked there for about 10 years as a pharma uh, regulatory affairs manager. So bringing medicine on the market and I had my own desk and everything and was happy there. Yeah, but as life goes, I I changed a bit as well and finally ended up in a software development company as a trainer and regulatory consultant. So that company was developing software for the pharmaceutical industry and exactly for that area that I worked in before. So I could bring in my, my knowledge and everything. And also it was a big step for me because um, it was a bit different that decision to go into the training um, area. like. I don't really like standing in front of people and having all the eyes towards me. And it was a, like a huge decision I had to make to, yeah, just try it out and maybe develop myself a bit further. So I've been working there for like four years, the last four years. But in between, like whenever I changed a job, I also made a bit of a break in between to kind of travel, to yeah, see the world, see different cultures. And my first break was towards uh, Brazil and Ireland. So the decision to go to Brazil was made because of my sports. Like I've heavily involved in capoeira, the, yeah, Brazilian martial art. And I wanted to train more, but also to understand the culture behind that sport. So I went to Brazil for a couple of weeks and afterwards to Ireland also to just calm down a bit and yeah, find myself and find out what I really want and what's important for me. So after Ireland, I went back in a job and just a couple of years later, it was the break, I think like five years ago, I had that deep desire to work with animals, like animals I always liked and loved and had cats and that stuff and went to animal shelters to pet them. And yeah, I, I had to, I felt the need to really work with them and also help them. So I went to South Africa into a true sanctuary, an animal sanctuary that actually take over animals that come from animal breeding farms and cup petting farms, which is actually a very big topic in South Africa and a very bad thing to do. And yeah, there I learned about the passion that people can bring towards animals and to the, the need to help them and yeah, I met so amazing people there, but also amazing animals. And I, I actually fell in love with one of the lions there. And he's kind of like my, my spirit animal, if you want to say. And I mean, I went back from that, um, from that sanctuary and yeah, stepped into another life, into a new job. And it was nice. And I traveled a lot with my job and it was just awesome. But still, there was something like inside me, some... Yeah, let's call it an unfilled space. And yeah, and I mean, working in that company was nice. I had nice colleagues, but it was, I don't know, it was something like, it's not my passion and I don't know why I'm doing that for and for whom. And like, for me, it wasn't my purpose. So I decided I have another break and uh, take a gap year. And then I thought like, 
uh, what am I going to do? And actually another dream of me, it's, uh, it's like opening a cafe or a bar and have like these like, uh, nice little cakes and cupcakes and muffins and just having a nice area with live music and like a dream a lot of people have, I guess. Um, but the other side was, oh, but I really want to work with animals. And yeah, with that decision, I, I really struggled a lot. And finally, finally the decision was made um, by, a, by a movie. I went to cinema. I mean, it was a long process between cafe or something with animals. And that with animals was, am I going back in my sanctuary? So do I want to do something else? And I thought about, I really love that sanctuary thing. They help the animals, they educate people, and it was just awesome there. But then it's kind of, I see animal behind fences, and I really don't want that. So I, I found that field guide thing, and I thought maybe that's a good, you know, a good course to just understand nature and to live in nature and to, to be with animals and not to kind of host them or something. So I had that field guide uh, in mind, but it's also a lot of money you have to invest and yeah, a different life, something I, I didn't know about. So I had all things in mind and then I went to to cinema. There was a movie, um, Sailing Conductors. It's about two guys that traveled from Australia to, to Germany and they just bought a sailing boat and yeah, went on their tour. And um, on their way, they met a lot of musicians and they produced a song with all the musicians they made. And at the end of that movie, there was this live music. So they all came on stage and they played that song. And I might start crying now. Yeah, it says, for what it's worth, my friend, it's never too late. And the whole song goes like this. And it was not only the music, but the, the lyrics that, I don't know, it, it just changed something in me. And I knew what the answer was. I knew I had to do that field guide course. And I mean, the whole decision to do something else. I mean, I'm, I'm 46, so it's not something, I'm not 20. I, I can't really change my whole life. And shall I do that in my age? All these things um, play a, a background role. But then I heard the song and I was like, I have to do that. It's, it's really about my, my, pers uh, my, my purpose and my passion. I need to do something I really see a purpose in. That sounds very um, touching and it's very um, passionate what you're doing. So the reason why you chose to be a trails guide, you've explained wonderfully right now. And you have written on your LinkedIn page, when I made the decision to start the course as a field and apprentice trails guide, I never imagined that this would happen. But during the last months, my perspective on things changed. And so did my view on this world and on the life. I lived. I want to be in nature. I want to be part of it. I want to sustain it. And I want other people to see its diversity and beauty as well. So what exactly was the change in your perspective? Back in Germany, I already had a lot of things that changed my perspective and my opinion of this world. Like the noise we, we hear on a daily basis. I mean, I live in Frankfurt, so I have the airport. I have a street in front of my house, so there's a lot of cars driving. I have the train station just um, close to me, so I hear the trains as well. And it's a lot of artificial noise I couldn't really stand. But also I see a lot of, I don't know, waste going on on this world. Like so much plastic and yeah, how we treat the world even in, in Frankfurt. Yeah, I had a lot of thoughts about that already back home. But then I came here and I mean, the bush is quite a natural environment. So there is no plastic flowing around most of the times. I mean, even here in a touch of hawk, I from time to time see a plastic bottle just on the road, which really annoys me. But I also see the animals, how they interact, like the plants, how they, how they grow and how the animals eat it and just how basic this environment is. And during the course, I mean, we had lessons about astronomy, we had lessons about ecology, about geology, mm -hmm. about mammals, about reptiles, about birds, and how all that is connected to each other. And just shortly said, it's that the geography in an area defines how the soil is in that area, and the soil defines how the plants, or what the plant, or what kind of plants grow in that area. The type of plants define the um, herbivores in that area and the insects in that area. And the herbivores define the kind of predators in that area. 
So this is all connected. And at the end, you have the decomposers that, yeah, whenever an animal or a plant dies, so how that goes back into the nutrient cycle. So it's all connected to each other. And then looking back to, to Germany, I see, or not, not even to Germany, it's all over the world. I see how differently we live in, in our natural environment and how we put a kind of a barrier in between that normal cycle that should be everywhere. Like we pick up um, dog sketch by a plastic bag and put it in the bin. I mean, we all know the Kehrwoche in German, right? It's um, the neighbors have to kind of broom the, uh, the other street in front of the house and get rid of all the leaves. But actually it's nature and it belongs there and it has a purpose. And we just put it away um, to have a clean environment. And this is what really struck me here. And I mean, I knew it before and we all learned it in school. But when you really see that life cycle, I mean, we just had a, um, a kill here at the water hole. There's a little elephant baby that was killed. And it's so sad, like I love elephants. But then the lions have to feed on something. And now I see the vultures coming and the hyenas and they get rid of the bones and the rest and the flesh and they all bring it back to, to nature. So it's really a life cycle. And this is something that I'm, or that is very obvious for me here. And in your in a artificial environment environment like a village or a city uh, with a lot of concrete yeah we often forget about that mm -hmm. i'm i'm very touched by your story because i am part of a group of storytellers and we speak on behalf of gaia so we include gaia nature um, animals plants as stakeholders so we need mm -hmm. to consider them to be part of the world and, and to be able to communicate with us. And you just beautifully explain that. And what I really love, you followed your heart and you followed all the signs that came step by step and your passion became your purpose. And you were very, very courageous in, in just doing that. And actually at the moment we are looking at women in leadership and all the things you said are just so very, very, agenda setting they are very very also feminine core values and and then what you said in the end about you know the hyenas and the lions and everybody um having their their peace this actually is mutualism right and this is community collective being mutualism everyone everyone serves the other we serve nature nature serves us and um yeah i'm, I'm very touched and now that we talk about fe feminine leadership I would like to know if you can, um, can, can make a bridge from the animals, what you have learned, how we can transform it into leadership. That's a difficult question. I thought a lot about it. And I mean, if I, if I see into leadership, so, I mean, leadership needs a team, right? You need to lead a team or a group or something. So if I think about the animals that live in a group, um, for example, elephants, one of my favorites, or hyenas as well. Um, lions as a pride, they live as a pride, or termites. I love termites. They're so interesting. It's just ridiculous. Um, they all have spe a specific role and social system. And um, just picking out the elephants again, probably because they are led by a matriarch, so uh, a female, but actually it doesn't matter if it's a male or a female. These animals, they live for like 60 years. 60 more than 60 years and their knowledge is transported over via generations usually the oldest one just teaches the children where to find water and the oldest one the matriarch leads them towards water they um, they lead their group towards food sources they know what animals are the predators and they have so much knowledge and when i see them interacting together it's very funny matriarchs are quite patient with their young ones and it's really so funny, like the kind of 10 year old elephants, which is their teenage age, they are just so funny to watch. They, I mean, they're individuals as well, right? But they still have to kind of fit into the herd. But then sometimes they go crazy and yeah, there are some troublemakers and um, the whole herd, but especially the matriarch is very patient with them. But at one point when it's getting too much, um, she really makes a point with them and you hear, hear that the grumble it's actually one of my most famous sounds in the world that deep rumble 
and the trumpet team and then the uh, matriarch, also the elderly ones, they come running and just make a point. And they show the younger ones the boundary. And this is something I really um, appreciate towards leadership as well, is to create that frame where everybody can be an individual, but also teach the younger ones what is the social structure of this group, but also the knowledge about yeah, what tasks do we have to do? Like, where do we find food? Where do we find water? I mean, it, it secures their survival, right? And sometimes in leadership, what I miss is, yeah, the transport of the knowledge. I mean, in my life, I had a couple of leaders, not uh, especially mine, but team leaders. But yeah, they always have their secret, things they don't really tell. And this is something I really missed because you need to understand the bigger picture and knowledge is so important for everybody in the group. And yeah, this is probably something I really learned from, from the elephants. It's patient, creating that frame. You're securing the borders, but also really transporting that knowledge. And you know, looking into other groups like lions, for example, they also need to work as a team, but there's also a specific role system in there. Like usually the females hunt, on the other side, the lion, the male one, um, secures the borders, patrols the borders, and just protects the whole, the whole group. And so every single individual has its own role, and that's so important to just keep that group stable and you're successful as well. Or having a look into termites. I mean, the whole termite, especially that, uh, the termites that build that mound, it's just amazing. Like the whole system, inside they can keep um, a temperature stable for the whole time. They have little windows they can open if it's too humid in there or too warm or too cold. And everybody, every individual has a specific role. So in their cost system, you have the queen that reproduces, you have the soldiers that protect the whole colony, and you have the workers that feed the little fungi inside there, that bring food to the queen. And yeah, it's, everybody has its role. And I often think about what is if the soldiers decide, like, I, I hate my job. I'm always out and need to risk my life to protect the whole colony. I don't like that. I rather want to be, I don't know, a worker that would kind of mix the whole system of the lioness said, like, no, I'm not going hunting. That, that would, yeah, would destroy the, the group. It, it wouldn't work. And I mean, I like individualism as well, and I'm happy uh, we humans have that, but we also, uh, also should kind of stick a bit to not our roles exactly. I mean, I'm not a fan fun. The woman belongs, you know, in the kitchen and the man goes working kind of like this, but just focus on our strength and yeah, do what we are strong in, independent what we studied or uh, yeah, where we come from. It's, it's, it's very interesting because I always say we jump onto jobs that are not ours. So yeah. if, we, if we go within, if we meditate, if we wait, if we are patient, then our jobs come, right? Thank you. Thank you very much. What I hear now, it's, uh, first of all, it's a process uh, which we all have to go through to come there. I know my story, my history, what I'm doing today, I never thought about. 20 years ago, I would be doing that even when I studied business management. I think it is a kind of history and also to embrace what we have gone through in the past and embrace what we, we are um, learning right now and what we are experiencing today. And um, what you were saying, Nicole, is I, I would call it in, in the management language today is transparency. And I really, I, I go there with you that even me as a, as a, as a, a freelancer for, for many, many companies, I always tell them I need to understand the, 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 the different points where I always touch a little bit in my context, in the OD or in the in the intercultural trainings or when I do the market entrance studies, they always ask me, well, you don't need to know that. I said, I don't want to, you to disclose anything. It's just for me to understand, to make my job better because um, to, to get the interfaces in a correct way is very important and not to just look in your environment. I think you, you mentioned that very nicely and uh, it's a very nice learning out um, from, from the animals world. We, we totally forgot to say that you are right now, where exactly in Namibia and which place actually? Yeah, so I am lucky enough to find a place in, in the Etosha National Park. Mm -hmm. So when I came to Namibia in March, it was part of my field guide course. So I 
actually it's a one year course, but um, the theory and the time in the bush and the learning part was in South Africa. And part of this one year course was to have some practical experience. So I'm a field guide right now, but um, I should have yeah, gone into uh, to a place where I have a mentor, a field guide mentor that teaches me and uh, where I should probably have done own rice as well with guests. Um, and I did that on a conservation farm, a cheetah conservation place. Yeah. But then COVID came and there were no tourists and there were no rice and no guides. So I stayed there for a while and then decided that I really want to learn more about nature and learn more about the animals, which I couldn't do there. It was really focused on conservation, mm -hmm. which was also awesome to get some insight in there. I mean, um, it was an awesome place and we unfortunately had some captive cheetahs there, but it's, yeah, there's no other place where they could go. Yeah, and then I went to Etosha Park for just a vacation and I met some incredible people there and yeah, over contacts and contacts and contacts. I'm now in the Tosha Park where I was offered a volunteer position. It's actually desk based, but I still have enough time to just drive out or just go here to the water hole and watch the animals. So I learn incredibly much. So Namibia is far away from where we are right now. So we're in Germany, right? And we are in Europe. So why would we need to care about endangered animals in, in the other parts of the world? First, if we would lose animals, it would be re uh, very sad because some of the animals and plants are just like amazing and beautiful. But secondly, when you talked about biodiversity um, at the beginning, like every animal or every plant has a niche in the environment, in nature coming back to the nutrient cycle, like you have a specific type of plant and there the elephants feed on and then the plants come out at the end and there's some dung beetles or termites feeding on that one. So this has a sense and this makes sense and it's very important for the ecosystem to be sustained. And probably if we lose one or two animal species, um, it wouldn't really harm the complete ecosystem. But I was just talking with my boss about that a couple of days ago. He's uh, the veterinarian of the Tosha Park and he was very much involved into the black rhino rescue um, in the past. And I mean, probably we have at the moment about like 5,000 rhinos left. And if they go extinct, we wouldn't matter. I mean, we still have elephants and we still have other animals. But starting from the plants, like if we start eroding our soil, for example, to create more farmland, then we would you know, get rid of some plants and then the animals that live there um, couldn't feed anymore. And there would no dung be at the end of the day that these animals produce. And then the dung beetles and the termites that live there, that wouldn't have anything to feed on or I mean, dung beetles create a little ball to also reproduce, to put the larvae inside, then they couldn't do that, so they couldn't be reproduced. Then we have the hornbills, it's a beautiful bird, and I think a lot of people know it from the king of lions. So that bird likes to feed on uh, dung beetles, and also the termites, they like to feed on the dung. So the termites would probably go extinct in that area. But termites and dung beetles play a vital role in bringing nutrients back into the into the soil and also to loosen the soil. And also there's the artwork that feeds on the, uh, on the termites, so this one would go extinct. And if a couple of animals go extinct, not only the black rhino, but also the white one and also the elephant and some other herbivores, then the whole cycle would be disturbed. And all of a sudden, yeah, we would have a different climate in here because, I don't know, um, elephants also feed on, on wood and they kind of, they're so destructive, they rip over whole trees, um, which is also uh, important for animals to feed on that, also termites feed on that wood, but also that brings nutrients back into the life cycle. And they stop bush encroachment, for example, if they would stop um, ripping over and destroying um, the woods, there would be less seed dispersal, for example. So that would destroy the whole ecosystem and forest would probably become desert and it would change the biodiversity in that area. And slowly, slowly, as it is right now, it would change the whole environment. And if the climate would change and just here in Namibia, it would have impact on whole Africa and at the end in 
maybe not a couple of years, but in a couple of centuries, would change the climate in other countries as well. It would definitely have an impact climate-wise in other countries. And I mean, we see it with the rainforest in, in Brazil. If that's burning, of course, that has an impact on you know, the global warming. But also, we lose a lot of biodiversity in there, which is just a shame. Well, that's, on one hand, it's very complex, but on the other hand, it's very simple. If you look at from the view from the animals, they just do their thing. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, it has so much impact on so many things, on soil, on plants, and so on and so on. So I'm asking myself, where is our niche? <laughs> <laughs> that's a question I ask myself very often. <laughs> Thank you very much, Nicole, um, for your time and your um, input and your insights uh, with your experience towards also leadership, purpose and passion. And I have taken one quote from your uh, LinkedIn page also, that's which you have chosen as a quote. Uh, I would like to take this. It says, if you can't figure out your purpose, figure out your passion for your mm -hmm. passion will lead you right into your purpose, which was said by T.D. Jakes. So I think that is a wonderful thing, which uh, matches also to our talk here. And uh, I thank you so much for your time. Also, for you. Yes, will... and I thank you too. Wow. Yeah. Do you have a message you want to place? Yeah, I'm not sure. There's so many messages I do have. It's, I mean, the time here, what I learned just for myself, and that's maybe the message um, I can transport to others. I mean, I came here with just a suitcase and a small suitcase and a backpack and the backpack was full with books and yeah, I just have a couple of clothes here and live a very minimalistic life in comparison to what I have and actually it makes me much happier. It makes me very happy to wake up with a bird call, even if I have the most annoying bird calls here outside. Um, I can go sleeping with the lion's roar which is just a privilege I have here and I can see nature how it is with very few plastic rubbish or other rubbish flying around and very few artificial noise. And it really makes me happy. It's actually all I need in my life. And yeah, maybe just have a look on your own life and find out what your passion is and find out what you need. And I mean, there's so many things we can change. We only have this one planet and it's so worth to sustain it. And the jungle is awesome out there in the bush and it's not a concrete jungle that is worth living for. And yeah, just focus on the little things. I mean, I start to love insects ridiculously. It's so diverse and you see so many big and small, beautiful things out there. Just take your time and focus what's really important for you, but also how you can help the world to yeah keep its beauty it's it's a lovely world out there i love Thank you, you. <laughs> <laughs>